Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. What we saw yesterday is a boost from private investment from the likes of Larry Frank of BlackRock. He was here at the G7. And what these in private investment funds are trying to do is boost money going to the global south, middle income countries. And part of this is made possible by programs at the World Bank. And I'm pleased to be joined by Anjay Banga. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, John there was talking about a big emphasis, especially on Africa. This is to try, one, to counter China from the U.S. point of view, but also European leaders are trying to stem the flow of migration. How are you seeing this public-private partnership play out? Yes, I think Africa, the real situation is that Africa is going to be a billion and a half people going to two. And frankly, how can you not have a continent of that type contributing to future economic growth? That's the other way of looking at why Africa. And so what I'm trying to talk about there is what creates jobs for those young people. It's got a demographic dividend coming through it. But if you don't give them clean air, clean water, health care and education when they're growing up and jobs when they're older, we have a problem with that demographic dividend becoming a liability. Can't do that only with government money and multilateral money. That's why people like what Larry did yesterday or Satya was talking about. These are all the ways to get private sector money as well to come in at scale to help create the jobs in that continent. How difficult are these conversations on the sideline of the G7 when you yeah. see leaders here coming mm -hmm. up wounded mm -hmm. by recent elections, mm -hmm. battered, because what their electorate is focused on is rising prices at home mm -hmm. and immigration coming into their country. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, you have leaders talking about investments in other parts of the world yeah. and also what's going on, of course, with the war in Ukraine. Yeah, but remember, if you're discussing private sector investing, this is actually good for these leaders because it's a way to enhance every dollar that governments and multilateral institutions put in to add a little more and that's very very helpful to them so it just depends how you approach this discussion my way of approaching it is it's not all about the money you give one-on-one -on -one bilaterally it's about the leverage you get so for example if you give the World Bank money into what we call IDA which is the institution that provides grants and concessional financing to the poorer countries, a lot of which are currently in Africa, unfortunately, that gets the leverage. Every dollar you give me as a country, as capital, I can make it four times. So leaders know that too. And then if you bring in the private sector, that four can become eight and ten. So people are thinking about how to get a dollar to go to ten, not just a dollar for a dollar. And I think that makes for a good conversation. But is multilateralism harder, which I know you're a big believer in, when you see the rise of nationalism? Oh, yeah. Sure. Listen, I've been saying for years when I was in my old job in the private sector that one of the biggest things that worries me is chauvinistic nationalism because it tends to create uh, the absence of you know, connectivity. But I think if you look at the last few months itself, we've managed to get capital and hybrid capital and portfolio guarantees into our institution. And we are the one that's working with this multilateralism. So let me give you an example. People keep asking me about the debt crisis in Africa, right? And if you think about the four countries from Africa that entered the G20 common framework, Zambia, Chad, Ethiopia, and Ghana, from the time they entered, we in the bank have given them $16 billion of money. Nobody else has given them money. Of that 16, eight was concessional and eight was pure grants. Of that 16, nine was net positive. So that's all multilateralism at work. People just talk about one part of it, but multilateralism does work with the leverage that institutions like the bank provide. We, of course, have a U.S. election coming up, and part of what you've wanted to expand in your approach to the World Bank is not just poverty, but also climate. Do you think that would be at risk if we were to see a Trump presidency? No, uh, not really. I remember that during his prior presidency, he was one of those who actually gave the capital increase to the World Bank. He sees the value of this leverage and the value of this kind of institution. Just to be clear, when I talked about a livable planet, I want to make sure you know it's not just climate. It's fragility, conflict, violence. It's things like pandemics and health care. Because the whole idea of livable planet allows you to expand the aperture depending on what's relevant in that country, that region. In some cases it is climate, in some cases it's fragility conflict that is driving things, in others it is climate that is driving the fragility and conflict. You have to get to the root cause and try and go at it. Will there be more pressure, you think, whether or not it's Trump or Biden, potentially to figure out what's going on with China? They are the biggest bilateral creditor, and many say that what they are doing in a lot of these countries is called a debt trap. Yeah, interesting. So I think where they are today is quite different from what it probably was some years ago. All the conversations we've had, the G20 Common Framework and the IMF and the World Bank run something called this Global Debt uh, Sustainability Roundtable. And in that, everybody comes, the multilateral so are there us, the bilateral creditors, 
the private sector creditors, of which there is a very large amount, and then the so-called earlier ones, the Paris Club. What's really changed is it's not just bilateral credit that's an issue, it's also the private sector that is involved in lending. So today, if you want to do a, a debt restructuring for these countries, you have to first know who's put what money on the table, what's it cost, what's the covenants of its repayment, what's the, the whole thing in it. Get that data on a sheet. Without that, it's very hard to know how to adjust that money in. So that took time. But as you see it getting done, and you can begin to see countries moving through the framework, I still think it's too slow. I think it should be faster, because if you make it faster, more countries will feel emboldened to enter into the framework. And I think we need to work our way through this. What you're offering, do you see as a viable path for these countries instead of, say, turning to China? Oh, yes. I think it's not an either or. Buy just China. People are borrowing money from India. They're borrowing money from the United States. They're borrowing money from the UK. Remember this, bilateral creditors have been around for a long time. It may be called ODA in some cases, it may be actual uh, lending through some countries. People, there are countries borrowing bilaterally as well. I don't think it's an either or, that it has to be either multilateral or bilateral. I just think it has to be done in a fair way, a transparent way, in a way that we can all understand what's going on, and then do it in a way that the countries who are borrowing also don't use only the borrowing as a resource, but also spend efforts on domestic resource mobilization, doing other things that enable them to free up the resources to do the right thing with development. Ajay Banga, thank you so much for your time.